Okay, we are back at it. And today we're going to talk about the Berlin crisis from 1958 to 61. Now, this is the second Berlin crisis uh, in the Cold War, the first one being in 1948 and 49 with the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift. Do not confuse the Berlin blockade with this later crisis that results in the Berlin Wall. Um, so we're gonna start off with a little reminder of what's been going on in Germany since 1949. Um, it, it's permanently divided following the Berlin airlift with now a new West German state and an East German state with the city of Berlin that's gonna maintain its four power occupation that had been there since the end of World War II. The Soviet Union occupying East Berlin, the United States and Britain and France keeping an eye on West Berlin. West Germany since World War II has got a larger population. It is economically larger. Uh, there's greater industrial output. Uh, they have received millions of dollars in Marshall Plan aid and they've got a democratic government. Whereas in East Germany, uh, the Soviet Union instituted forced collectivization of their farms and nationalization of industry. This has stagnated agriculture and, and, and industrial production in East Germany. There have been no free elections in East Germany since 1946. In 1953, the workers of East Germany rose up in protest of their working conditions and their pay. Um, and this would be suppressed by, by Soviet tanks. So we get a definitely a tale of two Germanys, and this has resulted in thousands of East Germans attempting to migrate into West Germany, causing a problem that Nikita Khrushchev characterized as the city of Berlin being a fishbone in East Germany's gullet. This West Berlin that was propped up as a, a model for democratic and capitalist um, ideals is sitting right amidst the Soviet sector um, and the, the Soviet satellite state of East Germany. In 1958, this crisis begins where easy border crossings between East and West Berlin will lead to the migration of young and primarily educated East Germans to the West, resulting in what we can call a brain drain of talented East Germans. In November of 1958, Nikita Khrushchev will petition um, his counterparts that Berlin should be demilitarized and become a free city with no occupation whatsoever. He threatened that this needed to happen within six months or he would give control of the access routes to West Germany to the East German government. And at that point, the East German government might just go and shut things down. Khrushchev will ultimately back down from this ultimatum, but it did force a conversation about Berlin. And those conversations would take place in summits uh, that the United States and the Soviet Union would have. In 1959, Eisenhower and Khrushchev will meet in Camp David uh, in the United States. And there were future discussions planned in Moscow, but those ceased because of the U2 crisis in May of 1960. All the while, East Germans are continuing to flood into West Germany. Now, in November of 1960, there's a presidential election in the United States that brings the young and comparatively inexperienced John F. Kennedy into the presidency. And he rolls out a new foreign policy approach to, uh, to the threat of communism that he calls flexible response. More spending on conventional forces, continuing to grow our nuclear arsenal, and continuing to aid countries that were resisting communism. This was seen as a move away from Eisenhower's brinkmanship policies of massive retaliation. Uh, Kennedy would argue that, that we would need a, a, a wider choice between humiliation and all-out nuclear war. And this was the flexibility in his flexible response. Khrushchev, for his part, sees this as some weakness and hopes he can push on the inexperienced Kennedy to get what he wants in Berlin. But still the migrations continue. With no resolution to the Berlin question, tens of thousands of East Berliners are continuing to move into the West. On one day alone in August of 1961, 40,000 East Berliners are moving to the West. And you can see this massive graph um, of, of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of East Berliners moving to the West. 
This ultimately pushes Khrushchev in East Germany to close the border on August 13th, 1961. West Berlin would then be surrounded by initially barbed wire and later a concrete wall that will lock East Berliners out of the West. Now, this isn't exactly a new Berlin blockade. There will still be access points through rail and, and, and road um, into West Berlin, but these will be heavily guarded by East German and Soviet troops. Then a wall is constructed that becomes known as the Berlin Wall. Um, this encloses West Berlin, but really it is built to keep East Berliners from fleeing into West Berlin and using that as their exit out of East Germany. For Nikita Khrushchev, the building of the wall was an admission that Soviet propaganda had failed. The wall was needed to keep people from fleeing the communist world. For Berlin, it permanently divides that city. And this wall will separate families and friends, and they will not be able to reconnect until the wall comes down in 1989. It will, however, ease some tensions in the Cold War, because just like the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift ultimately resulted in a divided Germany that solved the question of how do we put Germany back together again after World War II, we just don't. This Berlin Wall is going to solve this new problem. How do you stop the migration from, from East Berliners into West Berlin? You build a wall. And so now this greatest area of tension is going to be closed off in Germany. Americans, of course, will protest the building of the wall, but threats of future conflict are going to ease. And we're going to see the Cold War tensions again move away from Europe over to Asia again. And the wall will forevermore be a symbol of the division between East and West. And for the United States, this is a propaganda victory for American ideals in West Berlin. We'll see you next time when we talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis.